The jackals are a species of aliens who resemble humanoid canids and use technology built from salvaged scrap. Without access to advanced weapons or vehicles, they rely on ambush and ferocity in close combat to win. The jackals were a collection of nomadic tribes until they discovered the wreckage of alien ships on their planet. Soon after, they made contact with the other species of Sirius and were suddenly thrust from tribal hunters into the space age. Now the jackals' way of life has been forever changed as they have begun to migrate to the stars. Hey everybody, welcome back. This is War Boss Fitz, and today we're going to talk about the apocalyptic scavenger puppies, the jackals. Now hopefully in this video I get the audio right. Um, in the last video, the audio was pretty bad. Um, if you want to see how much of a caveman I am and what I have to go through to record these videos, I'll put it at the end. It's nobody else's fault but my own because I don't have the equipment or the place to do it. But for you guys, I'm doing it anyway. So the first thing we're going to start off with is the special rules for the army. I'm going to go ahead and put this up on the screen. This is a selection of the rules that go with this army. A lot of the stuff on here, a lot of the stuff on here just has different names, but they're the same rules for other armies. And I want to put this up so you guys can see what we're talking about when these rules come up. So let's start at the top. Beacon. Friendly units using ambush may ignore distance restrictions from enemies if they are deployed within six inches of this model. Now, normally with the ambush rule, you can't show up within nine inches of the enemy, but if this guy's closer, you can show up within six inches of this. Now that beacon unit is going to be on a lot of your scout type units. I think it's hooked into a backpack piece of equipment. We'll see it when we get there. Bounding. When this model is activated, you may place it anywhere within D3 plus 1. Now this is going to be on the beast units. Just to make them, I guess, a little bit faster without actually giving them fast. Carnivore. Gets plus 1 to hit in melee. Everything in the army gets this, so the whole army is going to be plus 1 to hit in melee. Charged ammo counts as having the ambush rule and gets AP plus 3 when shooting on the round in which it deploys. Real handy for a surprise blam 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 unit. Dodge. Enemies get negative 1 in melee when attacking units where all models have this rule. Hit and route. This model and its unit get ambush. Martial prowess. Whilst inside terrain or in cover, this model and its unit gets plus 1 to hit rolls in melee or shooting. Pick 1. So for that, I'm assuming you have to pick before the game starts, or you pick when you attach that model. There's no, like, hard way in the army builder to choose one or the other. It's just kind of common sense which one you choose, depending on which unit you attach it to. Protected. Attacks targeting units where all models have this rule count as having AP minus 1 to a minimum of AP 0. This is like carrying around shields. Prowl. Enemies over 12 inches away get negative 2 to hit when shooting at this model and its unit whilst inside terrain or in cover. So it is like stealth plus. Scrap ammo. This model and its unit get rending when shooting. Nice little upgrade. Stinger bombs. Whenever this model moves over enemy units, pick one of them and roll one die on a 6 plus. It takes one to hit. Now it says whenever this model moves over an enemy unit. So you roll once for every model that is in the unit that has this rule. So if you have a squad of 5... You make five rolls, and for every six, the enemy takes a hit. Taser. Unmodified rolls of six are multiplied by two. Only original hit counts for six. That's like if you have something that is rending in Taser. If you roll a six, you'd have one rending, minus four AP, and then one regular hit that goes through. And while we're here, let's do the spells. Feral Strike. Target enemy unit within 12. Takes two hits with AP2. Nice little plinking spell with uh, AP2. It's for the heavier infantry. Lean and mean target two friendly units within 12 to get plus one next time they advance or plus two next time they rush and charge. Yeah, a little bit faster. Pushing your puppies a little bit harder. I'm probably going to make so many bad jokes I'm going to have to edit out. Psy Canines, two power. Target two friendly units within 12 inches. Get AP plus one next time they fight in melee. It does what it says. Pretty good. Quill Blast, two. Target enemy unit within 12 takes six hits. So this is something just shelling out a whole bunch of quick hits. Make six saves. Power Maw. Strength three. Target enemy unit within nine takes one hit with AP two and deadly six. This is a get off my lawn spell. So this is going to be with deadly six. It's going to be able to knock out light tanks, light walkers, extremely heavy infantry. So that'll be good. Shaper. Three power. Target two friendly units with 18 to get regeneration next time they take wounds. Which is great. I can see putting that on some of the larger units, but those smaller ones might not be worth it. We'll get into it as we go. 
So just like last time, we're gonna leave we're gonna leave the characters for last because they are a buffing force of all the other units. So we're gonna start off with the Nomads. You get ten of them in a squad. They're quality five, defense five, ten close combat weapons for A1, ten scrap rifles for twenty four A1, Carnivore and Strider. Now I didn't bring this up yet because Strider is kind of a blanket uh, special rule. Strider pretty much means that you ignore the effects of difficult terrain or you just don't care about difficult terrain unless it's impassable. You can move right through it like it's not really there. So let's go over the upgrades. Satellite backpack. So there's that beacon rule. So you can make these guys, your basic no man squad, a uh, nexus for ambushers. You can switch all the scrap rifles out for pistols and close combat weapons with the carnivore rule attached to them. That's not a bad choice. Then replace up to two scrap rifles with power spiker, nine inch range, A2 rending, a force blaster, 12 inch range, A1 AP4, shotgun for six inch, A4 AP1, a zapper gun, 12 inch, two attacks with taser, rocket launcher, 18 inch, A1 AP2 deadly three, fumigator, 12 inch, A1 blast three poison reliable, or a hunting rifle 24 inch a1 ap1 sniper so it looks like you can give these guys a nice array of different stuff let's go through the shorter range stuff first here okay power spiker uh, nine inch a2 rending if this is a unit that's moving forward i could definitely see using the power spiker because the nine inch range isn't really going to affect you much it's going to be uh used pretty much the turn before you close into combat and with the rending yeah i think i went over rending but just in case i haven't rending is a rule that uh, when you hit somebody with it they're minus one to regeneration roll which is always good and then it's also if you roll a six it's going to be counted as ap4 so very good with this weapon having rending that's something useful to have if you want to have a close combat oriented squad force blaster 12 inch a1 ap4 this would be a plasma gun in every other army which are always good to have some ap4 sprinkled everywhere scrap shotgun a4 ap1 now this would probably, if you're making a close combat squad, this would probably be worth more than the power spiker to me in a close combat squad because the AP-1 is going to be, in my opinion, the AP-1 is a little bit more reliable than the rending itself. But it's a trade-off with a 6-inch range versus the 9-inch range. If you're going to be in range of the shotgun, you might as well charge into combat because with your carnivore rule, you're more than likely going to hit more with your close combat attacks than you would be with that shotgun. Zapper gun, 12 inches, A2 taser this is going to be an rng gun ap nothing and if you roll a six you get two extra hits with it so you're either going to get no hits or a lot of hits it's total rng on that one that was up to you rocket launcher 18 inch range a1 ap2 deadly three standard rocket launcher good for taking out very heavy infantry throwing some wounds on some uh, light vehicles Fumigator, 12 inch, A1, blast three, poison, reliable. It looks like this is the weapon that they have instead of a flamethrower. Fumigator, I'm expecting just noxious gas to come out of that. That's why it has poison on top of all the other rules for a flamer. Uh, poison's pretty cool. It's also another minus one to regeneration, and your enemy has to re-roll all the sixes they get for saves. So if you're fighting against somebody who has very light armor, Throw some fumigators in there because if they save on a five or six or even a six, it'll just be like, okay, all those you passed, re-roll them. And with a reliable, you're hitting on a two. And then there's hunting rifle, 24 inch A1 AP1 sniper. I wouldn't put it in this squad. There's a squad coming up to be a lot better in that come with them. And we'll get to those pretty soon. Next up are the Stalkers. These are the true close combat jackal squads. You get five of them to begin with. They're quality five, defense five with 10 close combat weapons. So they have two attacks each. Uh, Carnivore, Dodge, Furious, Scout, Strider. Yeah, close combat. If anyone watches my channel, you'll see that I definitely like punching things in the mouth. So let's go over the rules. Carnivores, you're going to be hitting on a four in close combat. Dodge, the enemy are minus one to hit you in close combat. Furious, in close combat, you roll a six to hit, you get two hits. Scout means you get a up to 12 inch move before the game even starts to get you in, in where you need to be. And then Strider, again, you get to move right through difficult terrain, no problem. Now, the upgrades, you have the Claw Hand for one attack at AP4, or a Junk Sword at one attack AP1 with Rending. This one's a toss-up. Who are you going after? Are you playing against somebody who has a lot of heavily armored infantry? Claw Hand all the way. 
are you fighting against someone who has a lot of regeneration? I would go with a jump sword just to give him minus one to his regeneration and the ability to pop off and hit him at AP4. Now the next one, one guy gets to switch out for a scrap club, which is A1 blast three, or a jagged hook, which is A1 AP2 deadly three. Again, for two different types of enemies, scrap club, if you're fighting against a lot of somebody, one attack, three hits, clearing out a bunch of little stuff. And the Jagged Hook, one attack at AP2 for Deadly 3 in case you're going up against something like the Oni we had from last week. Next up is the Elite. You get five of them in a squad with quality 4, defense 4, five close combat weapons, and five energy rifles, which is 24-inch A1 AP1, which would be the heavy rifle in every other human faction standard all-rounder. Carnivores, they get plus one to hit in close combat. Relentless. Relentless has changed in 3.0. You roll a six to hit in shooting, you get an additional hit, but only if you stand still. On to the upgrades. Satellite backpack gives them a beacon, so you can have ambushers come off of them. You can replace all the energy rifles with shotguns, which is 12 inches A2 AP1 for free. If you want to have a highly mobile army, shotgun is definitely the way to go. Half range, twice the number of attacks, the same AP. If you want to scoot these guys around, definitely go with a shotgun. And with the Strider, you're going to be jumping from cover to cover. Shotgun be the way I'd go. And then replace one energy rifle with a shred rifle, plasma rifle, flamer, or missile launcher. It's funny because the Nomads have the same type of weapons. They just have their own bespoke names. But in the Elite unit, I guess because they've salvaged these weapons from somewhere else, I can see that, that the Elites are scrappers. They're taking everybody else's weapon. That's why they don't have their own bespoke weapons. So, moving on. Moving on to Vultures. Quality 4, defense of 4, you get 5 of them. They have 5 close combat weapons, but they have 2 attacks apiece for each of those. And then they have 5 scrap pistols, which is 12 inch, A1. Ambush, which means they can come down anywhere outside and out of the enemy or use any of the beacons that we've seen on the other squads. Carnivore, plus 1 to hit in close combat. Flying, which means they pretty much ignore all terrain. And Stinger Bombs, this is the one where if they fly over top of somebody... Uh, each model rolls a dice, and if you roll six, the enemy takes a hit. Honestly, it's not very reliable, but it's a fun rule to have. Now, let's look at the weapon. Let's see, it looks like I cut off the top. It should be replaced all scrap pistol and close combat weapons with energy rifles. So you can have these guys kitted out to shoot, which is what the picture looks like it is, energy rifles. So 24 A1, AP1, same as the Elite's head. Then we get into the fun stuff here. Replace any scrap pistol and close combat weapon with an explosive spear. It's only one attack, but it's AP1. It's also reliable, so it hits on a two. So you lose one attack in close combat, but it pretty much is always going to hit. Even though they have carnivore guys, you can't take that reliable and push it to a 1+, plus because a 1 always fails. Then they have their upgrades. You can replace one scrap pistol with a force blaster, which is 12-inch plasma, a zapper gun, and a scrap shotgun, which we've gone over before. If you see yourself needing to be somewhere playing keep away, uh, I can see either using the shotgun or the zapper gun. But in this unit, I would just leave it. Now you can replace any close combat weapon with a junk sword or a claw gauntlet. Uh, the junk sword gives you AP1 and rending, or the claw gauntlet, which gives you two attacks AP4. So again, it depends on what you're going against, light stuff or heavy stuff. And then down at the bottom, you can replace with a scrap club or a jagged hook. We've already gone over these before. Scrap club, big old boom. Jagged Hook, very deadly, heavy infantry killer. Now, onto the trackers. This would be the unit that the hunting rifles are best with, and they actually come with it. So they're quality five, defense five, close combat weapons, three hunting rifles, 24 inch A1, AP1 sniper. Now it's 160 points for three of them, so these are gonna need to pop up and kill whatever they're aiming at immediately, and hopefully it's something that's a pretty high value target. Now they have carnivore, charged ammo, and strider. Charged ammo gives them the ambush rule and the AP3 when they deploy, so their job is to pop up and drop something. And you can also give them a satellite backpack with the beacon. That's their only upgrade. They're definitely made for one thing, and that's to pop up and take out high-value targets. Now we go to the hounds, because the jackals need hounds. The puppies need dogs. Just the fact they're 75 points, this is a real cheap throwaway combat unit. Quality 5, defense 5, 2 attacks apiece. They have carnivore, fast scout, and strider. Now that means they're going to hit on a 4 in close combat with Fast Scout and Strider. Turn 1, they could charge something that is 28 inches across the board. Is it worth it? It may be for 75 points. Throw something at them and be like, here, deal with this. Now their two upgrades are a Hunter Breed, which gives them Furious, which means on 6s, extra hits. And you can also give them Poison in Melee, which would be minus 1 to reach in, and they have to reroll 6s. So if you're fighting against something with light armor... Hell yeah, take some hounds, give them the Hunter Breed and Vicious Bite, 
throw them at them on turn one and say, take this many hits, and oh yeah, all those armor saves you made, just re-roll them. Beast Gunners, you get three of them in a squad for 185, quality five, defensive four. Three heavy claws, one attack, AP one. And three heavy machine guns, 30 inches, three attacks, AP-1. Bounding, carnivore, protected, strider, tough. Well, again, those rules are bounding. They get to move D3 plus one inch at the, at the beginning of their activation. Carnivore, they're going to be hitting on four in close combat. Protected, they're going to reduce the enemy armor penetration by one. Strider, they ignore difficult terrain. And tough, it takes three wounds to take them down. Now, their only option is to replace the heavy machine gun with a hunting rifle. That one's up to you. Um, again, me being an orc at a heart, moving forward to punch something in the mouth and just go deck a deck a deck of the whole time. Heavy machine guns is what I'm going to run them with, and I see absolutely no reason to change them. So then on to beast riding assault beasts. So quality five defensive four, three heavy claws, same as before, but they also have three explosive spears, which are the ones that hit on a two. Now bounding carnivore impact two strider and tough impact two. Uh, we haven't gone over it yet, but impact attacks are whenever you charge into the enemy, you get that many number of attacks. So if you have three beast riders with impact two, it would be six attacks. All those attacks hit on a two, and the enemy just has to make a regular armor save. There's no AP on those. The upgrades. We're going to go all the way to the bottom of the... So the hunting hook has two attacks with lance and reliable. Lance gives them an AP on the charge. So it would be just like explosive spears, except with more AP and more attacks. Then you can give them a harpoon or a goad spear. A harpoon looks like it's for more heavy infantry with the AP-3, and then the Goad Spear, that's going to be in case your enemy is regenerating. That's going to be minus one to regeneration. Six is your fishing form. It would be nice, but it's also more attacks than the Explosive Spears, but it's no longer reliable, so you're going to be hitting on a four instead of a two. So overall, these are a balanced unit, give and take, on each one of the weapon classes. For me, Hunting Hook seems to be the way to go. Just because they're reliable, they have an AP when they charge, and it's more attacks. Makes three of them like 210 points. I think it'll be worth it. The next unit we're moving to is the Great Beast. Quality 4 with a defense of 2. This is one tanky boy. Massive jaws with 6 attacks at AP 4 and a stomp with A4 AP 1. So when this thing gets into combat, it's going to rip things apart. Bounding, so it has its D3 plus 1 teleport. Carnivore, so it hits on a 3 in close combat. Fear of 2, which means it counts as causing 2 wounds all the time. Strider and Toughness 12. And the funny thing is, too, I actually printed one of these out for the army that I'm making. The Great Beast, even though it looks pretty big in the picture, it's not really that big. I don't know, some weird forced perspective going on there. But when we get to the army showcase and the battle report, you'll see. Upgrades! Harpoon Launcher and Spear Launcher. I think the funny thing is that you can actually run this thing without either of these weapons. And in my mind, that would be totally feasible. Having a Great Beast just be like a battering ramp. Especially down at the bottom with the Brutal Charge upgrade. Grade, give him impact six. Oh, that's just, I would call this thing a meat missile. Just fly at the enemy and smash into him. But just for, you know, completeness, <laughs> harpoon launcher, 12 inches, A1, AP4, deadly six. And spear launcher, 12 inches, A6, AP2. I don't know, man. It's only 12 inch range. That's, that's less than what your charge activation is, especially with a D3 plus one bounding. I would never put a gun on this thing. I would just slam it into stuff. But of course, that's my orc brain talking to me. My my smooth, no wrinkle orc brain. Your mileage may vary. You must you might love it with a spear launcher. Meh. <laughs> Moving on. Our next unit. We're moving into the Titanic size things. We're looking at the long neck. Quality 4, defensive 2, another big tanky boy. He's got a heavy rail cannon, 30 inches, A6, AP2, deadly 3, lock on. Heavy tusk, A6, rending. Stomp, A6, AP2. Carnivore, Fear 3, Strider, and Tough 18. Now that heavy rail cannon uh, with its deadly 3 and lock on, it looks like it's made to shoot planes. But it's got 6 attacks with AP2 at deadly 3. It's made to shoot everything. Shoot everything with the rail cannon. I think it's funny that the Great Beast is probably better in combat than the Long Neck is. Because where its heavy tusk only has rending and the Great Beast has the AP on its mouth. And the Long Neck does not have impacts. Huh. All right, moving on to the upgrades. Uh, replace the rail cannon with a heavy energy cannon, 36 inch range, A3, AP4, deadly six. This thing's gonna be what shoots at the other enemy heavy stuff, like heavy tanks or heavy walkers, 
with Deadly Six is made to kill vehicles. Heavy Rocket Array, 30 inches, A3, AP2, Blast 6, and Indirect. I don't know how you could even hide this thing, but potentially if you did, you could fire Indirect at something. Uh, it has the potential of 18 hits with its three shots at Blast 6 and AP2, so I mean, it'll definitely clear out a whole lot of stuff, even Heavy Infantry at AP2. But the thing starts at 755 points, so it, it better. So then we're going to move on to the biggest model. I've seen YouTube channels put this thing up and like, oh my god, I painted the biggest model in modeling history. I mean, yeah, pretty big. A lot of parts to it. But uh, the Mastodon starting at 1195 points. Quality 4, defensive 2, great tusks. 8 attacks, AP4, scatter cannon, 30 inches, A6, AP2, blast 3, indirect, pipe rockets, 24, A6, AP2, and a stomp of A8, AP2. Carnivore, fear 4, strider, tough 24, transport 21, so you can stick 21 little puppies inside of this thing. Now the weapons do what the weapons do. Uh, the scatter cannon is potentially 18 hits at AP2, so it will kill everything. Well, again, with indirect, you're not going to hide this thing. Uh, unless you somehow get your jackals in a city fight, I don't see you hiding this thing. I don't even think it'd fit down a street. Now, I mean, when I play Grimdark Future, I use the true line of sight. They have different ways of doing line of sight in the rules. But uh, true line of sight, you're not hiding this. You're just not. You could replace the scatter cannon with a piercing cannon for 36, A6, deadly 3, AP2, indirect. Again, you're not going to hide it. But six shots at deadly 3 with AP2 is going to be killing a whole bunch of stuff. And then you could, just for funsies, strap on two heavy machine guns. Then that brings us to a veteran, quality 5, defense 5, one close combat weapon with an elite scrap rifle, carnivore, hero, strider, tough. These are going to be your characters that you use to buff stuff with. Uh, the first set of upgrades are all the special rules we went over before, prowl, hidden route, martial prowl, scrap ammo, and caster. And then replacing the elite scrap rifle, uh, we got a pistol and close combat weapon, goad spear, explosive spear, and harpoon, all things that we've seen already. You can replace a pistol with a shotgun or an elite hunting rifle, and then you can replace its close combat weapon with all the different kinds of close combat weapons we've seen so far. This is going to be a where do you want to put it to buff which unit and then just season to taste. If you're with a close combat squad, give it a close combat weapon, something that's going to complement the squad it's with. Or if you're in a shooting squad, give it a hunting rifle, a shotgun, or keep it with the elite scrap rifle. And then lastly, our second character, which is going to be our big character for this. It's just an elite veteran. It's just a little bit better than the last version. Again, he has he has all the same rules, but he can take a backpack, jetpack, gunner beast, or an assault beast. So this is going to be a guy who leads your specialty squads. And then he has all the different options that you could give the first one. And so that's it. That's a look at every unit in the Jackal Army book. So here's the list we came up with for our battle today. Let's start at the front. We've got 10 Stalkers, followed by two squads of 10 Nomads, all armed with scrap rifles. One of them has a Veteran in there. Five Vultures with close combat weapons and pistols. Ignore the Spears. Then in the back, we have three Beast Riders with heavy claws and hooks. Led by a veteran that has the ambush ability and a spear. Three beast gunners, all armed with heavy machine guns. And then a great beast, just armed with jaws and stomp. Ignore the giant crossbow on its back. It's not armed with it. The model just left a big old hole there if I didn't put it. So I put it anyways. Oh, I also gave him the impact six ability. The thoughts for all these choices, since we are going to be playing against the Eternal Dynasty, our army from the last game, these are made to get up close relatively quickly and cause some havoc with their carnivore rule. We'll see how they do on the table today. And showing up as our opposing force today is the Eternal Dynasty. Now, this army we went over in our last How to Play video. We gave a breakdown of all the units, just like we did with the Jackals. So the army list is going to be the same as last time. We have a Dynasty leader with a Carbine, who was also a caster, and he was very instrumental in the last game. We'll see how he pulls it off today. Two squads of 10 warriors, all armed with eight long rifles, two plasma rifles. One squad has two laser guns. One squad has one laser gun armed drone. Five attack drones with laser guns and tasers. Three onis, each equipped with a gun fist. One cyber beast and five cyber lizards, both having the scout rule. Our MVP from the last game, a dragon bike with three heavy laser guns. Here we have an overall view of the board. We have three objectives, two sitting right outside of the deployment zones and one directly in the middle of the board. 
Both the deployment zone ones are rather defensible, but the one in the middle, which is the one that's probably going to have the fiercest fighting, is definitely out in the open. So expect a lot of carnage there. Deployment is complete. The jackals look like they've loaded one side, the one where the objective is near their deployment zone. But remember, they can move through any terrain like it's not there because the whole army has the strider rule. Over on the Eternal Dynasty side, all the way on their left flank, you can see that the dragon bike is there. Hopefully he's going to be able to counter the great beast of the jackals with his long range, and it looks like he has a pretty good sight line up and down the board there. We have a squad of warriors that have already deployed on top of the objective near their deployment zone. They are going to expect to sit there and hold that with their long range being able to pump out some shots downfield. All the cyber beasts in the middle with the attack drone standing beside them. And another squad of warriors in cover with pretty good sight line down the board covering that objective. And the Onis with their heavier firepower all the way on the right flank. Now before turn one starts, the little cyber critters all move forward 12 inches to get behind the massive jumble of terrain in the middle. And they're going to see how everything else shakes out on which direction they're going to go. On to turn number one. Rolling off, we got a three and a one. It looks like the jackals are going to go first. The Great Beast rolls a 5 for his bounding, so he's going to end up with 16 inches worth of movement this turn. He just runs himself to cover in the middle of the board next turn. He will make his presence definitely known. The Oni move forward and fire their gun fists at the shadowy figures of the stalkers in the cover. Taking out two of them. The Beast Gunners roll a 6 for their bounding advance. Able to move 10 inches and still able to fire their heavy machine guns downrange at the Oni. With their stealth ability, the gunners need a 6 to hit and are able to score 2 hits, but the Oni's heavy armor stops it completely. The Dynasty Leader attempts to cast Eternal Guidance on his squad and, for the first time in two games, fails a casting. So the warrior unit walks between the cover and takes aim at the gunner beasts on the opposite side of the board. Firing off their plasma and long rifles and are able to score three wounds to take out one gunner beast. The nomads sitting on the back objective move forward, poking their noses out of cover to fire at the Eternal Dynasty Warriors on their objective on the other side of the board. They fire off a lot of rounds and eventually they're able to knock down two of the Eternal Dynasty Warriors. The Cyber Lizard seeing their chance charge into that squad of nomads that just wandered forward. Using their toxin bites, they are able to kill off three of the nomads, and the nomads are only to kill off two in return, forcing the nomads to take a morale test, which they then fail. They are now pinned. Nomads in the back of the board move forward to fire at the cyber lizards to give some help to their other nomad squad. <laughs> Scoring four hits, but the cyber lizards are able to save every single hit. The attack drones move forward to stick their little mechanical toes on the objective in No Man's Land. The stalkers move into No Man's Land, making sure to stay outside of 12 inches of that cyber beast. The Eternal Dynasty warriors that are sitting on their objective fire off into the nomads that are currently pinned. With their superior accuracy, they're able to kill off four of the nomads, proving who is the shooting army in this match. The Dragon Bike, using its flying ability, jumps over the giant pile of scrap to sit in front of the Eternal Dynasty Warriors, protecting them from incoming assaults, levels all three of its heavy laser cannons at the Great Beast and fires, only hitting once. Only one shot goes through. Final activation of the turn, the Cyber Beast is going to hold because he doesn't know which side of the board the party's going to be on. At the beginning of turn two, the Jackal's ambushers both show up. The Veteran and the Beast Riders charge into the back of the Eternal Dynasty Warrior Squad. Their impacts alone doing five wounds. Then all of their weapons combined do an additional eleven, wiping the squad off the map. As they charge through, they pull up behind the attack drones. The Oni decided to be proactive, choose to charge into the Stalkers, hoping to force a morale test on a route. Unfortunately for the Oni, as they charge in, the dice choose to completely abandoning them. Not a single hit out of all of them. The Stalkers take the opportunity to swing back and are able to score six wounds, taking down two of the Oni, who then pass their morale test. 
The Vulture Springer Trap jumping over another junk pile into the Dynasty Warriors on their objective. They drop their little bombs but are unable to roll a six to get a hit. Charging into combat, they are able to take out three of them, and the warriors are unable to take out any vultures in return. The vultures' four-up armor save being the foil in that plan. The dynasty warriors make their morale test. The attack drones turn to face the beast riders and fire off their laser guns. Only able to score one hit, but it does go through, causing a wound to the beast rider. The Great BC, no better options, charges head first into the dragon bike, slamming his head into the reinforced armor in the front of the bike. Its impact hits, causing three damage. It must have been knocked a little loopy because the rest of its ten attacks only caused one more additional point of damage. The dragon bike has no melee weapon, so it can't fight back, and it passes its morale test. The cyber lizards charge into the squad they've been fighting last turn and are able to do one wound to them. They fight back, but being pinned need a six to hit and fail all their attacks. So the nomads lose combat, and where they're already pinned, they automatically fail morale tests, causing them to run off the board. The second squad of jackal nomads charge into the cyber lizards because they remember they're a whole lot better in close combat than they are at shooting, quickly wiping the unit out and taking the objective back for the jackals. The Dynasty Warriors have find themselves surrounded fire on the vultures and are able to take down one with the plasma gunners as the rest of the shots go wild. The gunnery beasts move forward onto the objective on their side of the board and fire at the attack drones, only scoring one hit. And the attack drone saves. The stalkers on their activation attempt to finish off the Oni. Needing sixes, they're able to score a few hits, but the Oni's armor holds, only taking one wound. His attacks back completely miss but he's able to pass his morale test. The dragon bike levels all three of his laser cannons at the great beast and fires. Again, only able to get one hit. I guess without the caster's blessing, he's not as reliable as he was in the last game. But the armor save has failed, causing another three wounds to the great beast. The cyber beast decides to charge into the close combat beast riders. He's able to pull off two more wounds, which finally takes down one of the beast riders. But with the reliable weapons of the beast riders, and some good rolling for the heavy claws, they're able to put four wounds on the cyber beast, who then rolls a two for his morale test and fails his fearless save, causing him to flee off the board. The opening activation of turn three, the vultures decide to continue their persecution of the dynasty warriors on the objective, charging into combat, scoring many, many hits. But the dynasty warrior squad makes every single armor save. They attack back and kill off one vulture, which forces a morale test that the vultures fail, causing them to be pinned. Dragon Bike takes aim with all three of his heavy lasers at the great beast again, and this time luck is on its side as all three hit. The Great Beast is hard-pressed to make a single armor save, and fails all three, causing it to drop to the ground in a bloody heap. The Assault Beasts line up their charge on the attack drones and slam home, killing all five of them with ease. They turn to go to the other side of the board to assist with all the problems happening over there. The Dynasty Warriors that were so rudely attacked by the Vultures mount a bonsai charge into the already pinned Vulture unit, killing one of them. With the vultures attacks back, they hit with nothing. Since the vultures are already pinned and lost combat, they automatically take off running. From the objective on the other side of the board, the jackal nomads take aim and fire at the dragon bike, scoring three hits, but then the dragon bike fails two of its wounds, causing it to explode. The final squad to activate the Oni continues his fight in close combat with the stalkers. He's able to take out one of the stalkers in close combat, but then their combined attacks are able to drag the Oni down. They consolidate and then activate, moving on to the objective. The last unit for the Jackals to activate is the Gunnery Beasts, and seeing no way for them to get to a spot to get shots on the final turn, they decide to hold on the objective. The Dynasty Warriors reach out from their objective to shoot at the Jackals on the other objective, taking out two of them. With a bounding roll of a four, the Assault Beasts are just able to go far enough to hit the Eternal Dynasty Warrior squad on the back objective. The carnage is total. The Eternal Dynasty squad dies to a man. 
And with that activation, there are no more Eternal Dynasty left on the board, leaving to a final score of 3-0 to zero for a Jackal's win. So that's it, everybody. That's the Jackal's army list, a little bit of explanation of what they do, and a battle report to show you guys what happens when you use them. Now, my thoughts on the game. A couple of units that I probably wouldn't bring again. The Beast Gunners, in my opinion. Crap. Take them out. Get rid of them. Take another squad of Assault Riders. Because when those hit home, those are devastating. Instead of sitting in the back with having machine guns and maybe... What did they kill all game? One guy? The Vultures, I would have definitely given them some more upgrade weapons. They seem to um, not do much once they hit combat. It was kind of a surprise. And then hitting somebody with a wet noodle. The Great Beast, even though it didn't do much in this game, it really did not have the opportunity to do much. I could see it hitting an infantry squad, it would have done great. But the combination is between some bad rolling and only being able to attack the Dragon Bike, which had an armor save of two, I don't fault it for not doing that much this game. It was me as a commander, I put him in a bad spot. If he'd have been on the other flank and just charging up into No Man's Land with his armor of two, he would have been fine. Now the Nomads, in this particular case where they did have some longer range attacks, uh, it seemed to work out for them, but I think that was it's a case of what was on the field at the time, so I used it to its potential. Now, if they were close combat squads, I could see them being used to a higher potential. But overall, that's my thoughts on the Jackals. Leave a comment to tell me what you guys think. For this series, I believe what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and run through all the Grimdark Future stuff first and then switch over to Age of Fantasy. That gives me time in the background to build some Age of Fantasy armies up. Next episode, it's going to be the Saurian Star Host. I'm actually 70% done with them printing already, so we'll see if we get those out before the end of this week. Again, like, subscribe, comment, hit the bell. Tell me I'm doing things wrong because, again, I am a smooth-brained orc. And until next time, make sure you have fun out there. See you later. Oh, yeah, for my audio problems, you might have even heard some of them in this episode as much as I tried to mitigate it. One, where I have a six-year-old, my house is very, very noisy all the time. And the people that aren't six years old decide to watch the television at, I don't know what decibel level it is, but whatever 85 is on the volume level. So I could A, wait for them to get out of the house to record, or I could do it somewhere completely else. As far as doing it in the house, let me show you what the microphone sounds like attached to my computer. This is what it sounds like. Yeah, that uh, ain't going to work. One day, I will be professional enough to get a nice little standing microphone for myself, but that day is not today. So what I got to do, instead of using OBS and just scrolling through and, you know, being professional-ish looking, I have to screenshot everything, mock up all the panels in Paint 3D, email them to myself, and then after hours there, after everyone has left, I can hang out in a silent building and record for you guys, which everything I record is just on my phone right now, because again, I am caveman, no professional equipment. So then I have to go home, take the originals that I made at home, put them into the video software, drop in my recordings from before, edit them up on the fly there, and my voice cadence, my voice cadence when I'm thinking about stuff when I do this, oh my god, the amount of stuff I have to edit out. So for now, I'm not complaining, it's not a problem, but just whenever little things show up, to just little audio things show up, that hopefully explains a little bit why. But I will continue to do this until I find something better. Who knows, Christmas is coming up, maybe Santa will drop me some nice equipment. Who knows? I did ask Santa to get me a microphone like a month ago. Problem is, Santa's making me wait till Christmas. Why, why, why did I say anything? Why didn't I just go out and get it? But until next time, guys, see you later.